Okay, final question and answer session. Uh, as before, please raise your arm if you'd like to ask a question and if you could direct the question uh, to one specific member of the panel. Could I ask, because it's late in the day, I wonder if I could ask that the questions are short and that the answers are short. Uh, because Q&A can go on forever otherwise and uh, I'd like to give everybody an opportunity. So yes, the gentleman with the microphone. A question for Rob. Um, how many applications will be available in the health cloud when it goes live? And what, what sort of growth do you expect to see? Um, so that's for the November test phase. You're asking how many applications. Uh, hard to say at the moment. I think we've got about 10, which considering the project's only about three months, four months old, is not too bad. Uh, we're kind of cutting it short now. We want a, a, a sort of like a, a limited uh, proof of concept phase. Because uh, it's a research project, we're, we're still trying to prove that the concept is, is acceptable. So, so, so we're keeping it sort of like limited, low scale. We've got another test phase then coming up in March. That's going to be more strongly marketed. We're going to open it up to more people. We expect then to get, well, I can't reliably say how many more we want on, but, but we're going to be pushing for as many as we can at that stage. We, we just want to keep it manageable at the moment, so it's limited to about 10 for the time being. Maybe more depending on the companies that we've already got involved, depending on what they've got for us. Um, but in March, I think it's going to be unlimited. We're going to see how many we can get, so it's ready for going beyond the project then. Okay, thank you. Next question. Yes, uh, no, scratching his nose. <laughs> Come on, you must have some more questions. Okay, I've got, I've got a question for Dylan. Uh, what's the biggest difficulty or problem that you've faced in moving forward? I think one of the key challenges that we face is um, making sure that we communicate the relevance of digital technology to people and to the communities in the area. Uh, and that's an issue we need to address fairly strongly. Um, I think the other side of it is also making sure that as a public sector and service providers, we make sure that people are aware of the opportunity and raise their ambition about what they can achieve going forward. I think we combine uh, enthusiasm amongst the populace and also make sure that we deliver new and interesting services and that there's a hope for we can take things forward. Thank you. Okay. Back to the floor. No? No takers? Everybody wants to go home then. Right, can, can I uh, say thank you to our panel members, not just for sitting on the panel, but uh, also for their presentations this afternoon. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm going to try and wrap it up uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, a little health warning. Uh, this is my take on some of the key issues and concepts that have been put forward today and in no particular order you'll appreciate that without having a couple of hours to go away and think about it that's not possible. Uh, so I'm just trying to refresh your memory really rather than uh, to make comments or to prioritise anything one thing over another. Uh, first of all uh, ICT information and communications technology as a utility uh, you buy what you pay for and you don't need to pay for what you don't use. The transformative uses of uh, changing technology, uh, the word transform and uh, de delivering on new, new concepts, new ideas and facing new challenges through ICT uh, was important. Mistakes and difficulties, people make them, they're an inevitable fact of life. But as Hervé said, uh, Harvey Weaver, as he calls himself, uh, these are opportunities to learn if you allow them to be. One of the problems with grant authorities, public grant authorities, they don't like people to make mistakes. Then they say, well, public money's not been well spent. So it's a little bit of a difficulty, but I'm a great believer of getting it all out in the open and making sure we don't repeat mistakes because we've learned from them in the first place. I think collaboration, uh, we could probably argue uh, that uh, there's a consensus that collaboration is a good thing in the right situations. Uh, it helps us individually or in our organizations to increase capacity to do things that we couldn't otherwise do. 
and that above all and increasingly ICT as a set of tools better enable us to collaborate and to collaborate over ever greater distances. Collaboration is something for everybody, I believe, uh, and we've heard today from a variety uh, of people representing organizations, both large and very, very small micro-organizations even. Uh, I think it's an opportunity for collaboration too, both in terms of organizations, but also at a personal level. It gives us an opportunity to meet challenges and face the need for change. ICT can help us do that, and other people can help us do that. And if we put ICT and partnership together, then we get further forward and we avoid reinventing the wheel. ICT could, or should, simplify the way we find solutions. It reaches out yet further without the problems of overcoming conventional travel, provided that, of course, it's affordable. Digital ecosystems, which I've said before, I think is a slightly unfortunate turn of phrase, or rather they were called something else, but I don't have an alternative to give you, need to be scalable, or should be scalable, and it's one of their great benefits. They're sustainable in an evolutionary sense. That's not to say individual entities making them up will last forever, but the ecosystem as a whole should stay healthy as one organization or partner dies or goes away, finds something else to do, new ones are brought in, and so the ecosystem evolves. And they're a way of spreading and sharing risk. We've had various comments made about the cloud and the need for good broadband and the need for broadband access to be universally available and affordable. Uh, fairly critical. Um, there was a mention of common interest by Dylan, our last speaker. I'd like to tell you a story about a common interest. Uh, it was latent. Uh, I think Dylan said they went and asked people what they were using the internet for, and they asked the people who weren't using it why they weren't using it, which is all great stuff. But I don't know whether you've heard of a place called Noonan in the Netherlands, a community of about 25,000 people. And the councillors there approached the three Dutch telecom companies to provide ultra-fast broadband, and they said, not on your life, not a chance. Too small a market, not worth our while costs are much, much too high. So one of the councillors decided they take the, the challenge into their own hands. They went around every business and every household, took about a year, and they didn't say, do you want broadband, ultra-fast broadband? They said, what do you need? What, what services would you like that you're not currently getting? And they asked elderly people, and they asked youngsters, and they asked companies, large and small. And they went away and they thought about it, and they realized that in the vast majority of cases, the needs that had been expressed in the survey could actually be delivered through the internet, provided there was good bandwidth. And in fact, uh, as a result of that, 96% of the community took up the offer of ultra high-speed broadband. Uh, because of the numbers, it became very affordable. And guess what? The three telecoms companies came running back to Noonan to say to the guy in charge, Case Rovers, how did you do it? How did you do it? It's a new business model. And of course, they're now rolling it out through other towns and cities in the Netherlands. So sometimes, yes, you need to identify the needs, but sometimes they're hidden away. And what you don't want is technologists saying, how fast would you like your broadband to be? Because that's not what interests most people. So technology at the service of users, not the other way around, not users being driven by it. Collaboration is perhaps more central than ever if we want to be successful in our endeavors and sensibly used, we've seen that ICT can help. But especially, I think it can help SMEs. We heard this morning how uh, the use of cloud computing enables uh, organizations to, to pay for what they use and not uh, pay for what they don't use, and it's a very low cost of entry, uh, risk-free relatively, no capital expenditure. So ideal for small organizations, perhaps voluntary ones as well as SMEs. Anyone, as I've said, can benefit from uh, digital ecosystems and this approach to computing, ICT use, particularly rural areas. Now, I've told you I live in one and I suffer more than most. And it seems to me there's a real rural paradox. Actually, the people who live in the deeply rural areas are the people who've got most to benefit 
from having good broadband because then we don't have to rush off 25 miles to a supermarket, 25 miles to a hospital, and so on and so forth. So I'd like to see that 96% number that was mentioned for the UK broadband initiative actually become 100% by one means or another. Structures, I think, are important uh, in getting forward in this domain, and the role of regional policy, I think, is critical. I think you're lucky here in Wales. I'm a bit biased because I'm Welsh, of course, even though I don't live in the region. But I think you're lucky here in that the Welsh Government does have an understanding of and a commitment to a digital agenda and uh, provides a supportive context and environment for these sort of developments. We haven't actually mentioned hugely, I don't think, uh, the word networking as such, but I mean networking has become a bit of a buzzword. Everybody likes to network, and one of the great things about networks is they're flexible, and it's a form of collaboration, of course. Uh, flexible because you can duck in and out of them. Uh, membership is loose if you want to be actively engaged and a, a prior partner in a, in a project then, then you can do it that way but if you want to be on the fringe and just stay in touch until the time comes when something interests you more then you can do that as well. Nothing happens on its own inevitably you have to make a little bit of an effort to research to plan and to develop these things and one of the uh, important issues that hasn't been mentioned by anybody today is the issue about budgets and finance uh, we heard a little bit about interreg financing but I'm not talking about that if you're going as, a, as an organization to engage increasingly in collaboration and even if cloud computing brings down some of the ICT related costs there are other costs involved and there are other risks involved you may choose the wrong partners there's the time it takes to engage with them to understand them to build up trust and then to be able to move forward productively with them if you don't uh, make the commitment, you'll never know, of course. Uh, if you make the commitment, but it's inadequately resourced, perhaps that's a better word than finance, inadequately resourced, then again, you'll never know whether it'll succeed or not. There's been very little mention of the barriers. We've heard a lot about the benefits of digital ecosystems, ICT, cloud computing, and collaboration. Not a lot about the barriers, however, the things that get in the way, and we need to know more about those. One of them, for sure, is culture. Another one is language, if you're operating across regions or international boundaries. The Data Protection Act might be deemed a barrier, but actually I was really impressed by what John said because what he managed to do in a very short space of time was hold his hand up and say, look, we're here to help. We've got lots of things, lots of goodies that you can download and read. We're available for advice and guidance. Just come and ask us. So that obviously doesn't need to be one of the barriers, but I'm sure there are plenty of other barriers uh, that uh, could, could be uh, uh, identified and solutions to them overcome. I want to leave you with one final thing, slightly personal story again for what it's worth. Uh, I told you earlier this morning that I was lucky enough back in 1994 to be in a region that was selected as part of a small scale six region pilot uh, for regions to develop information society strategies and action plans. It was called Iris I. Uh, inf uh, I can't remember what it means now. Uh, it'll come back to me. Um, doesn't matter anyway, no consequence whatsoever. But it was funded by the European Commission, or part funded, I should say. Uh, but one element uh, that they insisted on in the, in the work plan uh, was the creation of a network of the six regions that was fully funded by the Commission for the first year and a half or so. And uh, it was my good fortune actually to be asked to run this network, uh, to be the sort of secretariat and give support to it, to the regional members, who used to meet on average about once a month, uh, either in a workshop in one of the regions or a management meeting somewhere, somewhere else, usually in Brussels. And uh, I'd been doing this for about six months, and before I started, I'd never heard of the structural funds, didn't even know the European Union doshed out money in that sort of way. So it was all a bit of an eye-opener to me. Uh, and we had a project officer who was, he was German if that's relevant, uh, very strictly observing all the rules and the regulations and every I had to be dotted, every T crossed. 
And it seemed to me that all of us were spending more of our time filling in forms and writing letters and writing reports and making submissions and not actually doing what we thought the project was about, which was to raise awareness of ICT, to encourage our public authorities to get together with the private sector and the voluntary sector and develop a strategy for it. Uh, anyway, I was having dinner one night with this guy from the Commission, not the German, uh, he was a Brit actually, um, very senior, um, but I'm not going to say who, and I said to him, uh, what, what's this all about? I don't get, I really don't get it. I've been thinking about this for six months now and going to all these meetings. I said, they're great fun and uh, enjoy meeting all these people and going to all these places, but what is the point? All we're doing is filling in forms and budget assessments and so on. We're not making any progress. And he turned to me and he said, Gareth, he said, actually, if the truth be told, we don't really care what you do as long as you talk to each other and get to know each other. And that's actually quite relevant this week or last week because the European Union was awarded the Nobel Prize for, Pre uh, Nobel Prize for Peace. Uh, somewhat controversially, as it happens, but the fact that we haven't had a war for 60 years in Europe uh, has, some people would argue, uh, to give some credit to the European Union. But actually working together and getting to know each other, to trust each other, to understand the differences and the diversity across regions actually is itself a huge learning experience from which you can gain a very great deal. And I'm sure that Wales, for example, is the richer for having worked with Lithuanians and with the Spanish and the Italians and so on. So long may it last, long may Interreg uh, continue. Uh, one little plea, please make it simpler. The cost of preparing a submission, a proposal, in people's time, with a very low likelihood it'll be selected, 18 out of 498 or whatever the statistic was. Uh, yeah, that, that's a pretty poor uh, success uh, ratio, it seems to me, for a, a, something that takes a huge amount of effort. So simplification would be wonderful. And on that note, I'll say thank you all very much. Uh, I hope you found today useful and enjoyable. Uh, please, 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 yet again, last time, uh, fill in your evaluation form. Uh, we guys here really want the feedback um, to know what you think. So thank you very much and have a safe journey home. <laughs>